Um, we could bring in Mr. Bradley. And Mr. Brown. Okay. Okay. Um, then we're ready to bring in the jury. A vet emergency? Sure thing. Please be seated. Opening statements on behalf of the dispense. This is not a case of premeditation. It's not a case of evil intent. It's not a case of hatred. It's not a case of spite. It's not a case of conscious reflection. This is not a case of a plan an intent to kill any officer. More specifically, it's not a case of a plan and intent to kill that individual. You will hear through the evidence the story that we told you. The story culminates basically on March 6, 2012, in Melbourne, the South Dakota Coast Guard. I say culminates because the events that transpire late that morning it just happened that when they start out backwards, you take a look backwards. I think the evidence will show you. You will hear that Ms. Kirchner and Mr. Bradley were on a two-week drug binge. And that drug binge included marijuana, cocaine, Xanax, ecstasy, pretty much you name it, it was involved. And it wasn't just a party in the evening or at night. 
It was day in, day out, the morning, from the time they woke up, the time they passed out. And that happened for two weeks, leading up to March 6th, 2012. You will see and hear from many different books. And I want to start uh, by saying that at the motel, you'll hear from several witnesses, and this is what Pastor Logan said. So the actions will be, you'll hear from this coachner on how the actions will transpire. And this coachner put it you may you will hear from her that she will put it in a pretty good uh, example. If you, we expect this coaching to say that they were so intoxicated, there is no explanation for the actions of the In fact, her words is that they were so intoxicated, they were so retarded, she has no explanation for why they did that. They were so effed up, she's got no explanation for that. They were not in the right frame of mind. She's got no explanation for that. Ms. Kirchner was with Mr. Bradley for two weeks leading up to March 6, 2012. She was side by side with him. She wasn't just her taking all these drugs. Mr. Bradley was taking them as well. You will hear from Andrew Jordan, who worked at the Econo Lodge. Andrew Jordan will tell you that moments before the SUV started to move, he was able to look at Mr. Bradley. He was able to make eye contact with Mr. Bradley. Mr. Jordan will tell you that Mr. Bradley, after looking at him, looked like he wasn't even there. with a blind stare. No one was there. You can hear Mr. Bradley say anything. The SUV starts to drive off, and Mr. Jordan will tell you that he's brushed. Not hit, he's brushed. He will tell you that his two young kids at home kick him harder than the way the SUV brushed him. The witnesses that work at the motel room will tell you this back in the state almost appeared that the SUV was trying to move around not to intentionally rush Mr. Jordan. I'm going to pause for a moment because he said that a lot of this you have to back up. Right? And I want to touch on Mr. Marks. Mr. McMaster said that you're going to hear from Mr. Marks. Mr. Marks is the individual who stole a firearm and then sold it to Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley did not get this firearm on March 6 of 2012. Mr. Marks will tell you this occurred back in November, eight months prior. What we'll also hear from Mr. Marks is that Mr. Marks doesn't let law enforcement know that he gave Mr. Bradley the gun until after March 6, 2012. Mr. Marks is testifying. He will tell you that he was looking at life in prison. And he became a state witness. And instead of serving his life in prison, he will tell you he has pled for eight years. Eight years in prison. Instead of life. You will also hear from Jeffrey D.A. Dr. Villegas is the individual that Mr. Master said that you will hear in this trial that he and Ms. Kirchner were having a telephone conversation. And this telephone conversation, according to Mr. Villegas, was going on while this stop was about to happen, after it happened, and while the events of just before and just after the events transpired. Mr. Villegas, you will hear time he's on probation for not one, but two sale cases. You will hear that Mr. Villegas, while he's on the phone with Ms. Kirchner, he will tell you that 
you believe Mr. Bradley made some statements. Now, we opposed Mr. Diegas just a few weeks ago before we started this trial. And on the road, you will hear as well that he indicated he had no clue who that guy was in the car. Never met him, couldn't compare him, couldn't, couldn't pick him out, had no idea who he was. Couldn't distinguish him from Joe Blow. And you will also hear that he now believes that person is Mr. Bradley. Mr. Diegas, again, does not come forward with this information on March 6, 2012. He doesn't get off the phone if these statements are in fact true, that he did hear these statements. He doesn't, he's not worried to hang up the phone and call 911. He doesn't tell a friend that he's with, hey, call 911. Something doesn't sound right. Or after he doesn't, after the call is disconnected with this perpetrator, he doesn't get on the phone and call 911 then. You won't hear when Mr. Diegas contacted law enforcement later that day or the day after. Law enforcement tracks him down and talks to Mr. Diegas. And Mr. Diegas, again, at the time, is on probation for two felonies. He's got 30 years in prison hanging over his head. He will tell you, when he takes the witness stand, that he's got a couple of months left on probation pretty confident to get off the probation. You will also hear, obviously, from Ms. Kirchner. As I said earlier, Ms. Kirchner will tell you the drug page that her and Mr. Bradley were on for two weeks leading up to March 6th. will also tell you that she was so intoxicated, so messed up, that she cannot remember the events. If she doesn't know, she can remember them because she just remembers them. That's what she remembers seeing or hearing or the things that somebody told her or that she's read about. She can't remember any exact words because she was so intoxicated. She will describe the events at the motel between her and Mr. Bradley as just pure craziness. Nothing makes sense. We were not in our right frame of mind. Ms. Kirchner will tell you that. Ms. Kirchner will also tell you some things that have just recently come into play with her. <coughs> most recently it popped in her mind. She will tell you that Mr. Bradley made some statements to her. You're going to have to weigh that and decide whether he's credible when it comes to that. You'll hear that on March 6, 2012, when she was arrested, she was interviewed by Agent Sima, Tabata Fora, and Times Weninger, Clark County Sheriff's Office. We'll hear that in no time she get into the specific statement <coughs> with those agents that she will tell in this court. Her interview lasted for well over an hour, well over an hour and a half. She was specifically asked those questions. You will hear that time and time again she lied to the agent Simak when in her spot of work. then comes up with these statements that supposedly Mr. Brandon Bradley tells her. She doesn't tell law enforcement or the government on March 6, 2012. She doesn't tell them the day after. She doesn't tell them a month after. She doesn't tell them six months after. She doesn't tell them any time in 2012. She doesn't bring them up any time in 2013. On January 15, 2014, Ms. Kirchner suddenly has some statements that Mr. Brandon Bradley told her the moments leading up to when Deputy Phil was shot. She 
hotels, with the presence of Agent Reynolds in the Clark County Sheriff's Office, and Mr. Master and Mr. Brown from the State Attorney's Office, and her attorneys. For the first time in almost two years, she now can remember certain statements that she's going to attribute to Mr. Brandon Brown. And you're going to have to look back and keep your eyes on this person. You have to evaluate her testimony. It's incredible. Ask yourselves, why? Why on January 15th, 2014, do you come forward with these statements that supposedly Mr. Brown has made? Why now? It's the 11th hour here that she was facing the death penalty as well. The death penalty had not been waived. She was going to be fighting for her life. You will hear that she had other charges pending prior to this case coming up. You will hear that those cases were dismissed for her testimony. You will hear when she agreed to tell the government Mr. Bradley made some statements that she did not have to fight for her life any longer. Instead of facing death or spending the rest of her life inside of a prison, she got a deal for 12 years. She'll be out close to eight years. There's going to be many questions that you're going to have to ask yourself. One question is, I believe the message. I can't trust the message. I can't trust the message. Can you be able to trust individuals that have had significant time in this perpetrator's position on life in the balance? Can you trust anything that's said on their part? You will hear that Mr. Bradley was arrested. They take him, uh, they want to interrogate him. Place him in the interrogation. You will hear that not one hour or two or three, but close to seven hours go by. Mr. Bradley's laying on the ground inside that room, passed out. You will hear that multiple times, Law enforcement tried to wake him up. He <coughs> wasn't waking up. We'll hear that some law enforcement officers had concerns. Mr. Bradley, are you okay? Is everything all right? About seven hours later, he's put onto a chair, and you will see him fall off. You will hear his mumbled speech. You will see the difficulty that Mr. Bradley has just sitting up, let alone speaking. You're going to have to judge whether or not statements he made in that room were voluntarily made. We'll have to decide that. We'll have to decide whether a two-week drug ban person who's passed out on the ground has to be woken up numerous times, placed in a chair, falling off of the chair, whether or not he's voluntarily speaking, voluntarily saying the things he wants to say, voluntarily waiving any rights that have been read to him. We'll also hear that Mr. Bradley's blood was taken from approximately 30, 39 hours after the arrest. And even that long, almost two days after, toxicology reports are positive for numerous drugs, and some drugs are through the roof. The levels are through the roof. I asked you, 
mentioned earlier that one of the questions you'll have to ask is can you trust the message? You can't trust the messengers. The other question you have to ask yourselves, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? Said you will see Mr. Bradley and all the difficulty in the world to sit in a chair of everyone sitting in here. You will hear that Mr. Bradley is brain damaged. These are all things the agents weren't concerned about to ask prior to speaking to Mr. Bradley. They saw him sweeping, passed out for hours. They saw the difficulty. You'll be able to see it when the video is played. Based on what you see and what you hear, you will then be asked to judge whether or not this was planned, this was intentionally done. Is anything voluntary there? <coughs> Back up again, and you see the evidence um, in the control car. Not gonna lie to you, very, very graphic. But before that even happens, you will see a very erratic driving pattern from Mr. Bradley. Running over a garbage can and keep the car straight. Signs of impairment, signs of a person who's clearly under the influence. What you will also see is a white SUV trying to make a turn to leave this small subdivision. You will not see a planned attack. You won't see an intentional attack. You will see a car trying to turn around and drive out of there. look back at when you see the video containing Mr. Bradley's statement, you will see and hear a person who is impaired, who is under the influence. You see a person who has fear, paranoid. Again, you will hear a toxicology screen, numbers of blue. Close of this trial, we're going to have one more chance to talk. And that's the opportunity that we will be able to recap everything that you've been able to see and hear, and things that you haven't seen, that you haven't heard. And so at that time, we're going to ask you, that based on statements like not in the right frame of mind, fear, paranoia, Intoxication, toxicology levels through the roof. Mr. Bradley is not guilty of robbery. And most importantly, this young 24 year old man, Brandon, is not guilty of first degree murder. Witnesses on behalf of the state. State Colonel's Officer Charles Colon.
Sir, if you'll come forward, step up before the clerk to be sworn. Hold on. You'll be seated. Sir, once seated, if you scoot your chair up, if you'll adjust that microphone, you're talking to the microphone. It helps us hear your testimony. It also aids in recording your testimony. Okay, thank you. Yes, you may. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Would you start out by telling the, uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury your name, and if you would, uh, direct them, direct your responses uh, directly to them. Uh, my name is Charles Colon, C-O-L-O-N. How are you employed, sir? I am employed as a high-risk special officer, specialist officer with the Department of Corrections. Uh, essentially a probation officer? Yes, sir. And do you know the defendant, uh, Brandon Lee Bradley? I do. You see him here in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. If you would uh, point to him and describe an article of clothing that he's wearing. 
Uh, he's sitting at the defense table wearing the dark uh, gray suit with the pink shirt. In May of 2010, did you have an occasion to come to uh, determine that uh, Mr. Bradley was on probation for three separate cases with the Florida Department of uh, Corrections? Um, yes, sir. Were you his initial probation officer? I was not. You have uh, since inherited the files for Mr. Uh, Bradley? I did supervise him for a brief period of time, and a, another officer transferred the case to me. Who was so the original officer? The original officer was uh, Mr. Tom Mohall. As part of the uh, probation that Mr. Bradley was on, was he required to obey all uh, instructions from the probation office? Uh, yes, sir. And was he also required to report in on a regular basis? Monthly, yes, sir. Uh, did there come a time that uh, Mr. Bradley failed to obey one of your instructions? Um, yes, sir. That had to do with remaining at the probation office as he was instructed to do? Uh, yes, sir. And as a result of that uh, failure to obey your instruction, did you request that arrest warrants, and in other reasons, did you request that arrest warrants be issued for him for violating the terms of his probation on the three cases that you were supervising? Yes, I did. What were the three cases that uh, you were supervising on? What case numbers? I'd, I'd have to refer to my file and for the... You would refresh your recollection to uh, refer to your file, please? Do you? Yes, sir. Case number 2007. Okay, um, Mr. Officer Colon, if you'll look at those documents, then um, close up your file, and then you'll have to testify not from the document. Yes, you may.
Honor, at this time, pursuant to the state's uh, request for the court to take judicial notice, the state would move into evidence the uh, exhibits A, B, and C, which are the three DOP arrest warrants. Okay, based on the court's ruling at the bench, um, B will be received. It's A, B, and C? That's correct. Okay, A will be received as states number one. B will be received as states number two. And C will be received as states number three. Officer Colon, I'm showing you what has now been admitted in states and states one, two, and three. So I'm raising the redacted versions of the three warrants that you requested from the court in the three cases that you were on probation for. Yes, sir. And when were the warrants issued? February 9th, 2011. Did you come to learn that uh, at some point, Mr. Bradley had uh, failed to report further for his probation after the warrants were issued? Yeah, it, it calls for a yes or no. Yes. You were still his supervisor? Yes. Even though he didn't obey the one day when you ordered him to remain, did he continue to report as he was required to do? No, he did not. Did you supplement the affidavit in violation with respect to his failure to appear to a report of probation? Yes, I did. Did you also subsequently learn that there were additional warrants that were issued for his arrest? And again, I'm in your application. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. I'll sustain the objection. Subsequently learned. As of uh, February of 2012, did you learn that, or did you amend uh, your affidavit to include additional charges? I don't recall the specific date that I amended the, the warrant. The original one was uh, February 2011. Would it refresh your recollection to uh, look at a Second amended affidavit? Yes, sir. But Yes, you may. Thank you. We'll just look at that to yourself and see if it uh, refreshes your recollection as to the date that you learned of additional charges. Yes, sir. And when was it that you learned that there were additional charges in addition to the three cases I'm saying? I amended this, uh, the affidavit January of 2012. State at this point we've moved into ex uh, evidence exhibits D and E. Two new warrants for Mr. Bradley's arrest. Okay, response from the defense? Okay, um, the objection is overruled. D will be received as states exhibit four. E will be received as states exhibit five. Yes, you may. Showing you uh, state's exhibits in evidence four and five, Officer Clone, can you look at those and tell me if the case numbers on those warrants match the case information that you would have with respect to the warrants? Yes, sir.
Okay, can you repeat your question? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm just checking if the case numbers on the two new warrants that have just been admitted match the information as to the new charges that you included in your affidavit in January 2005. Okay. The, the case number on, on the warrant here at the top? Yes, yeah, you may. Okay. <laughs> New allegations that you included in the second amended warrant. Okay. Same case numbers as the warrants that were issued by the court. I see. Okay. Um, yes, they are. And finally, when you submitted the applications for the warrants, did you include identifying information as to the individual you were seeking the warrants for? driver's license number, data of that information? Um, on the original warrant, th this was uh, when I submitted, and there was already a, uh, an arrest warrant issued, uh, I submitted an amended affidavit, not an additional warrant, but an amended affidavit since it was already a warrant, already active. And the warrant information included the driver's license number, data of work, and that information on the second and third pages? Um, yes. <laughs> at this point, we'll move into evidence. Uh, state's exhibit. Yeah, right there. Certified copy of the driver's license of Lieutenant Brandon Bradley. The driver's license number and identify information on it. Response from the defense. Well, it's actually Okay. Overruled. F will be received as state's exhibit number six. Questions for Officer Cohen? Cross examination by the defense. No questions. Okay, sir. Thank you for your testimony. You're free to step down. Thank you. Other witnesses on behalf of the state. If you'll come forward, step up before the clerk to be sworn. Sir, if you'll have a seat in the witness chair. Once seated, if you will, talk into that microphone. Adjust that microphone to fit you. It does help us hear your testimony. It also aids in recording your testimony. And Mr. McMaster. Good afternoon, Mr. Marks. Please state your full name for the record. Robert William Marks. And how old are you, Mr. Marks? 42. You're obviously uh, here as a, a prisoner today, is that correct? Yes, sir. And that's because you were convicted in 2013, February of last year, for count of armed burglary of a conveyance with a firearm, dealing stolen property and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, what is the sentence that you received for those violations? Eight years. And that had to do with the theft of a firearm? Yes, sir. Who did you uh, steal the firearm from? My brother-in-law. And what's your brother-in-law's name? Jason C. Uh, where did the theft take place? My house. And where were you living at the time? Off of Pinewood Road uh, in Melbourne. And what, if anything, did you do with the firearm after you stole it from Mr. C? I hid it in my garage. How long a period of time did you leave in the garage? I'm unsure. What did you do with it after that? I couldn't put it back in the car, so I, I sold it. And who did you sell it to? Boogie. 
And who is Boogie? I suppose it's Brandon. Okay. I want you to sustain. Okay, sustain. You knew an individual named Boogie. That's it. Yes, you may. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, the answer to the last question, which was sustained by the court, is stricken. It shall not be considered. It shall be disregarded. And Mr. McMaster. Mr. Marchie, you knew an individual uh, that you referred to as Boogie. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How long did you know Boogie? Not that long. About a year. I met him a couple times throughout a year. And when you went to sell him the firearm, where did you do that at? I uh, I drove down to the end of a galley. Met him there? Yes. Do you recall what the uh, area of O'Galley was? That you Behind last call. That's just off the U.S. one and the uh, O'Galley one? Yes, sir. And can you describe the uh, person that you know as Boogie? Not really, sir. It's, I was pretty drunk. I mean, I've seen a picture that they showed me. And that's the person that, I mean, I, I don't know the weight of them. I don't know this, you know, I was. Did you know anything about the gun itself? Are you familiar no, sir. With firearms? No, sir. I'm not. You were drunk when you stole the gun? Yes, sir, I was. Where was it that you took it from? The glove box out of his car. And do you recall what color the, the gun was? Black. The details about it? Black. And was it the kind that had a cylinder to it? Bomber goes around or no, semi automatic pistol? Yeah, it had a clip to it. And the individual that you refer to as Boogie, are you able to identify him today? He does not look like Boogie. You're referring to someone here in the courtroom? Yes, sir. You asked me that earlier. And you're are unable to identify anyone here in court as being that person that you knew as Boogie? Yes, sir. Because it looks different today, or the person yes, you're looking at today? Yes, sir. Uh, was Boogie a black man? Yes, sir. And about how tall was he? 5'5". Five, 5'6". Five, five, and heavy set, medium build? Medium build. Anything at all about the uh, uh, description of him at the time that you knew him that you can tell? No, sir. Now, you were a suspect by his brother-in-law, Mr. Seaton's your brother-in-law? Yes, sir. I'm married to and, a sister. Okay. And you were the suspect that, that at least the brother-in-law suspected as having taken him away. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you were interviewed by the police and by your brother-in-law and sister about this. Yes, sir. And you initially denied that you took the gun. Yes, sir. You at that point had actually already sold it to uh, Boogie? Yes, sir. There, there come a time after the March 6, 2012 murder of Deputy Barbara Hill that you were again interviewed about the gun itself. Yes, sir. Do you recall who it was that interviewed you? Um, Craig Carson. Agent with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. At the time that you were interviewed, were you asked? Yes, sir. And how was it that you normally got in touch with Boogie? I, I told him I had a phone number, which I'm not sure if I did or not. It happened a, a little while ago, and <coughs> I've been incarcerated for a minute. Yes, sir. I understand it's been a couple of years since then. You did have an opportunity earlier today to review the video video recorded statement that you made on March 9th of 2012 to Agent Carson, did you not? Yes, sir. And in there uh, was the number that you gave to Agent Carson uh, audible and visible to you when you gave the interview? Yes, sir. What was the number that you gave to him? 
objection to it? You're saying not in evidence. Let's have a bench conference. <laughs>